This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. We continue now with our examination of writing as language technology, looking specifically at bliss symbolics. Let's review. We have established that writing is a language technology and that writing is implemented as a system of symbols. Convention assigns meaning to those symbols. And in a human language writing system, each symbol represents an element of language. What happens if we attempt to create a writing system where these last two cases do not apply? That is, is it possible to create a writing system that is a system of symbols where symbols have inherent meaning and each symbol directly represents an idea? That is, is it possible to create meaningful symbols without conventions? We've previously examined that this idea is centuries old and that it dates back at least to the 17th century in Europe in the search for universal language. We've discussed that some of the earliest instances of this idea stemmed from a fundamental misunderstanding of the Chinese writing system. This is expounded by Francis Bacon in his 1605 book, The Advancement of Learning, where Bacon wrote of his incorrect understanding of the Chinese writing system. Bacon wrote, and we understand further that it is the use of China and the kingdoms of the High Levant to write in characters real, which express neither letters nor words in gross, but notions or things, insomuch as countries and provinces which understand not one another's language can nevertheless read one another's writings, because the characters are accepted more generally than the languages do extend, and therefore they have a vast multitude of characters, as many, I suppose, as radical words. Bacon was positing, incorrectly, that Chinese symbols did not represent elements of language, but rather that Chinese writing systems had inherent meaning, and that each symbol represented an idea or a thing. This incorrect notion of how Chinese writing works was also found in, by Charles Bliss. Charles Bliss was a Holocaust survivor who fled Europe for Shanghai in 1940. Over the course of the 1940s, Charles Bliss devised a writing system inspired by his incorrect understanding of Chinese. This writing system was called Bliss Symbolics. Bliss intended that this writing system be easy to use and be international and language agnostic. That is, that it should be useful and usable and easy to learn by speakers of any language. Bliss intended that this system would help reduce illiteracy and also help disabled people who have trouble learning other writing systems. Here are some examples of some of the basic symbols in Bliss Symbolics. On the upper left, we have a symbol for person. Across, we have symbols for person, man, woman, eye, legs, house, action, creation, fish, tree, ear, and love. There are also bliss symbolic symbols for somewhat more abstract notions, such as open and closed start, departure, approach, and arrival.
Some instances of bliss symbolics are also compositional. For example, if we take the bliss symbol for plus and the bliss symbol for intensity and combine them, we end up with a symbol that is a plus sign followed by an exclamation point close together. This has a meaning of positive, where the meanings of plus and intensity are combined compositionally to create the concept positive. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have three symbols used together, the last of which is the composite symbol positive. So we have the symbol for person, the symbol for feeling, the symbol for positive. Combined together represent the concept friend. So the idea is that a friend is defined compositionally as a person to whom you have positive feelings. Here's another example. The symbol for container and the symbol for up. Combined together with an action diacritic to represent the concept to give. This next example uses the composite symbol to give. So we have person to give knowledge, three symbols, combined together, represent the concept teacher. So a teacher is defined compositionally as a person who gives knowledge. Let's look at one more example of this compositionality. We have the symbol for animal and the symbol for feeling, a heart symbol. Combined together, and the concept represented is that of a pet. So a pet is an animal for whom you have a feeling. Let's now look at a more complex example of bliss symbolics. This is an, is a, an entire sentence. So we have multiple symbols combined together, and then those combined symbols used compositionally to form a sentence. Let's look at this piece by piece. To begin with, we have the symbol for person. We're going to skip the diacritic attached to the word person, the number one, and we're going to go through this sentence one essentially word at a time, looking at each word, looking at the base symbol for that word, the symbol that has the core of the meaning. So we started with person. Next, we have a heart symbol that represents feeling. The core of the next word is the symbol for legs. So, so far we've got person, feeling, legs. And finally, the last word has as its decor the symbol house. Now, some of these words have modifiers attached to them. So the second word, which has as its core the heart symbol for feeling, has a modifier attached to it, a wavy vertical line that represents the symbol for fire. So we have a feeling that is modified in some fire sort of way. So a fire feeling. In the last word in the sentence, the symbol for house is modified by the symbol for film. So a film house or a cinema. Now let's look at a different kind of modification. Modification that's essentially serving the role of inflection. So the first word representing a person, we're going to specify that this is first person, meaning I or me. So the symbol one next to the person symbol 
represents this is a first person, meaning I or me. In the second word, above the, the heart, representing feeling, we have an action symbol, representing that this is going to serve in some sort of verbal capacity. So we have a fire feeling that is an action. In the third word, we also have the action diacritic, so some sort of action involving legs. And finally, we have a, an arrow going out from the film symbol to the right, essentially serving as a locative diacritic, so indicating movement. So let's put all of these words together. The first word is a person that is in first person, or I. The second word, we have a feeling modified by fire that is an action. This com compositionally represents the concept to want. So to want is to have a fire feeling that you are acting upon. Next, we have a leg action. Well, a leg action could be the verb to go. So this together is the verb to go. And finally, we have film house movement or cinema to, so to the cinema. So I want go cinema to. And if we reorder this in your own native language, which here we're going to use English, this would be rephrased to create valid English as, I want to go to the cinema. So we've looked at some examples of compositionality in Bliss Symbolics at the word level and also at the sentence level. So. Does Bliss Symbolics do what it set out to do? That is, to be a system of symbols that is truly language independent, where the symbols themselves have inherent meaning that could be understood by anyone, and that it's not, it does not require conventions uh, in the way that other writing systems do. Well, let's look at some problems where Bliss Symbolics fails to meet the mark that it sets for itself. So first we're going to start with colors. So the way that colors are handled is that there's a base symbol for colors, for color, where we've got a circle with a dot inside that the circle then has an underbar underneath it. And then to specify which color, each color is just indexed. So the color symbol with the number one beside it means red. The color symbol with the number two beside it means orange. The color symbol with the number three beside it means yellow, and so on for however many colors that you that Bliss Symbolics attempts to represent. So a uh, later more obscure color, Persian blue, is number 87, color number 87. So a, the, the symbol for color with the number 87 beside it. So this is clearly a suboptimal way of describing colors. Um, HTML colors with RGB values could be a more modern equivalent, uh, but this is clearly not intuitive. Uh, you have to memorize the color chart in order to know which number assigns to which color. The next problem is an even bigger problem, and that's proper names. There is essentially no good way to deal with proper names in Bliss Symbolics. So just about every writing system has some mechanism for transliteration. So if I wanted to write my name in the Chinese writing system, there's a mechanism for doing that, where I could take my name, Lane Schwartz, and there would be a mechanism for writing that in the Chinese writing system. If I wanted to write it in the Georgian script or the Cyrillic script, 
there are mechanisms for doing that. But there's no mechanism for transliteration of names into bliss symbolics. The whole one of the whole points of bliss symbolics is that it's not tied to a sound system. But because it's not tied to a sound system, that means that the only option you have when it comes to foreign words or proper names is to literally write them in their original foreign orthography. So the example here is a bliss symbolics phrase that includes a proper name written in the Latin orthography. And someone who is not familiar with that orthography would have no idea how to pronounce it, even if that person were very familiar with bliss symbolics. Another more subtle but also deeply disturbing problem with bliss symbolics is that it in many cases fails to account for subtle differences in vocabulary items. So in many languages, there are words that are relatively similar in meaning, but are subtly different and are used in slightly different circumstances. So annoyance versus consternation. And in some cases, bliss symbolics handles this, and I'll show you an example in just a moment, but in many cases it doesn't. So this leads to the situation where it is in many cases not possible to be as expressive when writing in bliss symbolics as it is in a traditional human language writing system. So here's an example where there are differences that are attempted to be made that are handled again with this suboptimal indexing mechanism. So here we've got a symbol representing a particular type of four-legged animal, that means horse. Well, it means horse if there's a number one next to it. If there's a number two next to the same symbol, it means mule. Well, a horse and a mule are not the same animal, but they are related. And so you could see that the symbols might be related, but here they're just dealt with by indexing. So you just have to memorize that horse is the number one four-legged animal, animal, and mule is the number two. And a donkey is number three. So that's not ideal. List symbolics was designed to be easily accessible for speakers of every language. So is it possible to do that in principle? And if so, how do you do it? How do you design a system that is easily accessible for speakers of every language and ideally equally accessible to speakers of every language? Well, there are a lot of things that languages differ on. There are many things that every language does, but there are many more things that languages differ on. So, Languages tend to have language-specific mechanisms for handling tense, aspect, and mood. And distinctions of tense, aspect, and mood will be made differently in different languages. So some will focus more on one, some will focus more on the other. Some languages specify a definite article. So in English, we have the word the as opposed to a or a lack of an article. Um, Chinese and Russian do this differently. So Chinese typically doesn't have an equivalent to the English definite article. Some languages, if you have a sentence like, I am a person, have that word am, which in English is an inflection of the verb to be. So some languages have that equivalent, some don't. So in some languages, the equivalent sentence would simply be, I person. And different languages make distinctions, these kind of subtle annoyance versus consternation distinctions, along different dimensions. So some languages might have 18 different words for a particular, for waterfowl, specifying very specific different species. Whereas another language might just have a symbol, a single word for waterfowl. 
Uh, other languages might make distinctions in directions, in cardinal directions versus relative directions versus away from the ocean versus towards the ocean. And this is not easily translatable between languages necessarily. We also have differences in word order. So different languages have different word orders. So some languages will put the subject first and then the verb and then the object. Others might put the verb first and then the subject and then the object and so on, or subject, object, verb. Other languages have free word order and the information carried, for example, in English by word order might be carried by inflection in other languages. And the types of things that you inflect for is gonna vary from language to language. Some languages you have to inflect for gender, some languages you don't. Um, some, and the case system and the mood system are gonna vary from language to language. So there's lots of linguistic information that differs. And the question is, how well does Bliss Symbolics address this issue of attempting to be truly language independent? And the answer is somewhat, but far from completely. So when you dig into Bliss Symbolics, you can definitely tell there's an Indo-European bias that the designer was familiar with German and English. And so you can tell that there's this sort of bias to be, to have sentence order and word order that's somewhat like English. The next big question is, can you make, using Bliss Symbolics, the sort of fine-grained distinctions that natural languages and writing systems based on those languages can make? And the answer is not really. Uh, in some cases, you have these numerically indexed variants, but in general, Bliss Symbolics fails in being able to make these sort of subtle distinctions that every natural language can make. And finally, is it in fact easy? Is it easier to learn than other writing systems? This is really an empirical question, and the answer is we don't really have enough evidence to answer this question. Uh, there are some anecdotal reports in the context of uh, learning disabilities that individuals have said, yes, it is easier for me in particular, but there's really not been enough widespread study to be able to answer this question. So we really can't say yes to this question question at this time. So back to the big question. Going all the way back to 17th century Europe, there's been this dream among some to come up with inherently meaningful symbols where we don't have to specify convention, where we can define a set of symbols that are language independent, that everybody will just know what they mean, and we don't have to have conventions about what they mean. So we've got this question, is this possible? Can we do it? And Bliss Symbolics is one of the most thorough modern attempts to answer this question in the affirmative. And the answer that we find when we look linguistically here is not really. So is it possible to create inherently meaningful symbols that have this meaning absent convention? And the answer is no, not really.